Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this IT Governance GDPR webinar, webinar on demonstrating data protection by design and by default. I'm Alan Calder. I'm the founder and executive chairman of IT Governance, and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon. For those of you who've not been on one of these webinars with me before, uh, my background is in general business, but more specifically in the last uh, 20 odd years in information security and data protection. The book I wrote in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, IT Governance, a Manager's Guide to Data Protection, and what is now ISO 27001 is uh, now in its sixth edition and gave rise uh, indirectly to the creation of IT Governance, the company, and has led over the years to a business which is now operating in some, uh, with people on the ground in some 10 or 12 countries around the world, uh, supplying products and services into something like 150 different countries, primarily a one-stop shop for governance risk management and compliance products and services. And since the uh, arrival of GDPR in uh, on our horizons, uh, that's grown to become something close to 50% of our total activity. And we provide uh, a range of services which start with uh, books and toolkits and go on through software and very substantially into professional training, practitioner training, and of course, a wide range of consultancy services. And while uh, GDPR and data protection has become a core area, uh, cybersecurity, information security management, business continuity, penetration testing, cyber essentials, PCI, all of those uh, sitting alongside service management and the like uh, are at the heart of the integrated services which we offer to our clients who cross all industry sectors and all industry sizes. I'm going to be talking very briefly around the impact of the general data protection regulation, a little bit about the background to it, what data protection by design and by default means to organizations, the foundational principles of data protection, which go back uh, beyond the creation of the general data protection regulation, practical applications and how uh, building uh, data protection compliance frameworks can help you meet the specific obligation of the data protection regulation. In all, the webinar is about an hour long, so we're scheduled to finish at uh, 1600 GMT. Uh, I'll be talking for about 40 or 45 minutes or so, and there'll be an opportunity at the end for you to uh, ask and get answered questions on any aspect of the webinar or related stuff that you wish to. So as we're going through the webinar, if you find there are things you want to ask about, please do use the questions function in the GoToWebinar control panel, which should be on your screen. Uh, type a question into there. Um, do feel free to type the question the moment that you think of it. Once we come to the Q&A section, what I will do is I will go to the questions, I'll read the question out and then uh, share with you my, uh, my answer. So from a practical point of view, um, uh, uh, just get stuck in, see what you can uh, get from the webinar. And uh, in answer to what tends to be the first question, the slides will be available, uh, as will uh, those questions we've been able to answer to everybody registered on the webinar within about four or five days of the end of the webinar. So a sensible point is just a quick recap uh, of the context for uh, the GDPR. The key difference is the difference between directives and regulations. The uh, GDPR is a regulation as the uh, acronym suggests. And unlike directives, directives are issued by the European Commission and tell member state governments what they need to do. Uh, they need to create a law to achieve a certain set of objectives. And the directive usually sets out a couple or a number of minimum things the law should do, but allows member states to uh, embellish or develop or do whatever is appropriate from the perspective of their own jurisdictions. The regulation, on the other hand, goes into force as written. Uh, and that means that it applies in exactly the same way across all member states. It doesn't depend on member state enabling legislation. It goes into force by virtue of the uh, various founding treaties of the European Union. 
All regulations will allow some flexibility, uh, what are often called derogations that allow member states to make their own decisions about exactly where, for instance, age limits might be set. But unless there is a derogation, what you can rely on is that in, if you're in the United Kingdom, in France, Germany, Holland, if, a, if the GDPR says a particular thing, then it means the same thing in every member state. If there's a requirement that there is a lawful basis for processing and the uh, options are five, then it's the same five options defined in the same way in all member states. The current Data Protection Act in the United Kingdom is the UK's implementation of the Data Protection Directive uh, and uh, the Data Protection Directive goes back to 98 um, and the uh, different laws that different member states have put in place are very different with the result that there's a very unequal playing field from a data protection point of view. And the European Commission's drive to make things simpler isn't driven uh, primarily by a desire to make it easier for companies, although that's obviously one of the issues, the level playing field across the European Union, but it's to ensure that data subjects are able to exercise the same rights in all member states. And that's really at the heart of GDPR, the idea that data subjects or natural persons have rights. Uh, that means that we have rights uh, in relation to the ownership of our data, the protection of our data, the protection of the processing of the data, and to unrestricted movements of our data within the European Union. And our data comes in multiple formats. GDPR therefore has in material scope pretty well any format in which data is processed or stored, both on paper or in digital format. It includes uh, voice, it includes uh, images. Uh, any personal data that's part of or intended to be part of a filing system is in scope. Uh, and you can assume therefore that virtually anything that is personal data, wherever it is, however it's stored, will be caught. And the definition of personal data is very broad. It includes even online identifiers for, for people. It applies to controllers and processors, terms clearly defined in the regulation, uh, irrespective of where they're based. If they're providing, if they're in the European Union, you have to comply with GDPR. If you're outside the European Union providing services into it, again, you have to comply uh, with GDPR. So to a very real extent, the GDPR is the world's first global data protection regulation. It was uh, passed in May 2016. It entered into force on the 24th of May 2016. There's a two-year transition period and it applies across the European Union and across therefore the rest of the world that's providing services into the European Union from the 25th of May 2018. So we're now down to somewhat less than six months before the law applies. And uh, by the date of it comes into force, it means you need to be in compliance by that date, not just starting to comply thereafter. All of the data processing you're doing needs to be in compliance by that date because in a number of areas, the lawful basis of processing will change on that date. And that means that if you are processing on some other basis, you will be processing illegally. So if you haven't started, there's a significant amount of work that you need to be thinking about doing between now and the 25th of day. 25th of May. As I said, it enters into force. It applies in its entirety uh, to all member states from the 25th of May. There's a host of other regulation coming along behind it. The e-privacy regulation, which will bring similar kinds of fines, uh, is likely to uh, come into force in the course of the next 12 to 24 months. The Network and Information Security Directive is applying uh, cybersecurity and business continuity uh, principles to the uh, um, critical national infrastructure industry and to uh, internet platforms, all coming along as a swathe of cybersecurity and data protection related uh, regulation. Of course, we've had regulation before. What changes now is the shift in uh, potential liability. So uh, data subjects have the opportunity to bring actions where they think their rights have been transgressed and they can bring an action against a data controller or a data processor either where they live or where the processing is taking place. And a data subject can go so far as to bring an action for uh, a material compensation, i.e. money, uh, to make up for non-material damages. So they might be able to uh, bring an action saying they've been 
uh, so upset and bothered by the fact that you've been processing their data illegally that they need a financial sum of money to compensate them. And if you happen to uh, see it in the uh, news today, the gentleman who led the fight that uh, caused the safe harbor arrangements with the United States to uh, be found invalid uh, is in the process of setting up a non-government organization and seeking crowdfunding to create an entity which will exist simply to bring actions against uh, primarily, he says, those organizations which go out of their way not to comply with GDPR, but to bring actions to ensure that the rights of data subjects are protected. So that's the first issue. You're facing the possibility of uh, data subjects bringing actions because they think their rights have been transgressed and they will be supported by lawyers and by others whose life will revolve around helping data subjects uh, achieve their rights. The second uh, area that you have to pay attention to is the requirement of GDPR to report data breaches uh, and penalties will be applied to organizations that are in breach of the uh, GDPR. They'll be applied in the uh, they will be applied to organizations as a tariff of breaches which uh, applies to organizations of all sizes. The lower tariff is up to 2% of global turnover or 10 million euros, whichever is the higher. The um, higher tariff is 4% of global turnover or 20 million euros, again, whichever is the higher. And it's a, it's a tariff. There are a number of specific types of transgressions identified under each of those. And the, excuse me, and for each of them, the fine is the maximum that can be leveled. Uh, it doesn't mean you will get a 2% fine. It simply means that's the maximum. Uh, the extent of the fine will be determined substantially by the size of the transgression and the organization's level of negligence in meeting its obligations. So uh, in most instances, organizations, if you're dealing with the possibility of a penalty, will be looking to bring the level of the penalty down as much as possible. And data protection by design and by default is going to be at the heart of how you go about doing that. Supervisory authorities in the UK, the Information Commissioner, will know about the fact that you've had a data breach because you are going to be mandated to report data breaches. And the data breach is, is defined as any accidental or deliberate compromise of data. So uh, losing client records by error, losing patient records by error would be a data breach. Records not being available in order to carry out an operation would be a data breach. And whatever the breach is, the requirement is to notify the supervisory authority within 72 hours after discovery or as soon as possible. Uh, if you can't, if you didn't discover it, you would imagine that when it finally comes to the attention of the supervisory authority, the inability to have discovered that you were breached uh, would be taken as evidence of negligence and there are a number of specific things that you have to do when reporting a data breach. Failure to report a data breach carries a tariff up to 2% of global turnover uh, and therefore for most organizations part of preparation for GDPR is ensuring that you are able to identify information security incidents, determine whether or not there is a risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects. If there is, you have to report it. If there isn't, you don't need to. And if you are a processor or you have a contract with a data processor, you'll want to make sure that you have mechanisms in place which ensure the data processor knows that they too have to report breaches, all breaches, not just ones that uh, cause a risk to rights and freedoms to the data controller with whom they have a con contract, and they have to do that within 72 hours or as soon as they become aware of it. So a very significant obligation on processors to notify controllers, controllers to notify supervisory authorities in the case of a data breach, a very significant penalty for failing to notify and a potentially significant penalty that comes about as a result of the investigation that's triggered by your notifica notification of a data breach. In all instances, what you're going to be looking for is to make sure that the organization is able to minimize any consequence in terms of penalties. So 
if it's a very high risk, then not only do you have to notify the supervised authority, but for very high risks, you may also have to notify the data subjects themselves and notify them in a way that enables them to take action to protect their data. So if uh, the Equifax data breach were to happen under the GDPR um, environment, it would not be possible for the management of Equifax to keep the thing secret for as long as they did. It would be not possible for Equifax directors to go and buy shares or sell shares. And the people whose data was breached would have to have been told extremely quickly and about the same kind of time frame that it was being reported to supervisory authorities around the world. So, it's a significant set of changes and the starting point for organizations in thinking about compliance is thinking about the principles relating to the processing of personal data. So what you might call the six data processing principles, they're set out in article five of the GDPR. Uh, they, the core principle uh, you might think of as being the second, which is that all personal data should be collected for specified explicit and legitimate purposes. Explicit means there needs to be a very clearly identified reason for what you're going to do with the data. Um, if you're able to be explicit at that level, then it's relatively easy to determine what the lawful basis of processing it is, to do it fairly and to do it transparently. It's also possible to determine what actual data you need to minimize the data you collected because in the third principle said it should be limited to what's necessary, should be kept up to date and accurate for the purposes for which it was collected, retained only for as long as necessary and for long as necessary means in order to achieve the purpose for which it was collected, not because you thought of some other nice things to do with the data. And finally, it should be processed in a manner that will maintain security. And across all of those six data processing principles think, sits what you might call the seventh, which is the uh, principle of accountability. And GDPR says that the controller, and the controller here is an entity, not an individual, the controller has to be able to demonstrate compliance with the six data processing principles. So not just find compliance uh, and pretend that you are but able to demonstrate compliance. So if a supervised authority says demonstrate compliance, you need to be able to say, this is how we're going about complying with the six data processing principles. And the ICO, the Information Commissioner, in a speech to the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales back in January this year, made clear what she, and therefore by extension, other supervisory authorities across the European Union mean by the term uh, accountability. She said the new legislation creates an onus on organizations to make a real effort to comply. It means they have to shift from ticking boxes to building a culture of privacy that pervades the whole organization. It mandates organizations to put in place comprehensive but proportionate governance measures and that, she said, means that organizations' cultures have to change. You have to shift from thinking of data protection as an afterthought to thinking of data protection as being fundamental to how the organization deals with data. And therefore, it becomes part of the overall system's design and approach. It becomes part in a um, agile project environment, for instance, at the beginning of each sprint, you would need to be saying, and what implications does this have for data protection, designing new processes, designing new products, all of them, uh, if they involve personal data, need to have a consideration of the risks to rights and freedoms of data subjects. And remember that for the purposes of GDPR, business to business data is no different than business to consumer data. So Alan Calder at itgovernance.com identifies me. The fact that it's a business email address doesn't mean it's outside the scope of GDPR because GDPR makes no such differentiation. So business email addresses, business contact information, all of that is just as subject to GDPR as are the details of people living at home. So, if you're going to meet the requirements of accountability, how do you do that? And GDPR says the way you do that is through what it calls data protection by design and by default. The requirements here are set out very specifically in Article uh, 25 of the General Data Protection Regulation. And for those of you who don't have a copy, it's very easy to download it from the European Commission 
website. It's available in all of the uh, official languages of the European Union. It's written in pretty clear, non-legal language, so it's pretty easy to read exactly what it says, and it's made up of a set of recitals, which provide, if you like, background and further explanation, and then the articles themselves, which are the law. And Article 25 says specifically the controller, and remember that's the entity that determines the means and purposes of the processing of personal data, must implement appropriate technical and organizational measures. Uh, and there's no definition of what appropriate or technical or organizational means in GDPR. You have to, I'm afraid, work that out for yourselves. There are some techniques or methods you can use to do that, but you have to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to protect data, and you need to collect only data that's necessary for each specific purpose for which you're processing the data. It says the obligations around protection and minimization apply to uh, the amount of data you're collecting, the extent of the processing that you're doing, uh, the period for which you're storing it, who has access to that data, it says that personal data should not be made accessible, accessible to an indefinite number of natural persons without the data subject's intervention, and talks about pseudonymization and minimization as recognized techniques in data protection by design. Pseudonymization is the technique of taking uh, data that identifies somebody and breaking it up into a number of smaller elements, none of which will on their own identify somebody, but which when relinked by a linking code would enable the data sets to be reconstructed. Pseudonymization is different than anonymization. Anonymization removes permanently any personally identifying uh, uh, data and therefore makes the remnants outside the scope of GDPR. So data protection by design and by default, but how do you go about doing that? And the starting point for that is really in the work that the International Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners did back in 2010. And the Canadian Information and Privacy Commissioner published a document, there's a link to it on the bottom of the slide, which talks about the foundational principles of and the core approach to privacy uh, by design, or what then was called privacy by design, but in GDPR terms is data protection by design. Think of it, broadly speaking, for these purposes, much the same thing. The first principle is that your the organization's approach should be proactive, not reactive, preventative, not remedial. In other words, you should be thinking about issues that relate to protecting the data of uh, data subjects before it's a problem. You should be thinking about it at the planning stage of building processes. You should be thinking about it at the planning stage of designing a new marketing or sales activity or a new um, internal process of any sort, and it should be built into what you're doing. So you should be thinking in the same way as you should be thinking, for instance, about health and safety, about uh, what data we're collecting, what are we needed for, how do we apply the six data processing principles. And we should be thinking about protecting that data from a preventative point of view rather than, gosh, we've been breached, how can we fix it? You should be trying to make sure that the breach doesn't occur in the first place. The second principle is that privacy should be the default setting, that you shouldn't be thinking about we want to collect all this data, how do we justify it? You should be thinking about, we don't need to collect data, and the default is to protect the rights and freedoms of natural persons. The default is to say, we only need from you the very limited amount of data that enables us to do this specific thing that you transparently are aware of and whatever the lawful basis for processing it enables us to do. And that approach to privacy, says the third principle, should be embedded into the design of the process or of the organizational systems. Done properly, the fourth principle says that the uh, the functionality, the functionality that you achieve should give you a positive sum outcome, not a zero sum outcome. It's not a matter of um, we'll, as a result, have more complexity there, but we'll have, uh, which will cost us money, but we'll have uh, more compliance here, which will save us money, and the net outcome is uh, about the same. Um, the principle here is saying, actually, you should be looking at how Privacy by design brings benefits like it reduces storage, it simplifies processes, uh, it makes your 
legal compliance activity less costly and therefore might be able to feed through into a better presentation to customers which might enable you to win more business. So it should be a positive sum activity rather than a zero sum one. Principle five says the uh, approach to privacy should be end to end. It should be looking at the protection of data right through the data life cycle from the point at which it's decided to collect it all the way through to the point at which the data is no longer required and therefore is securely deleted and should therefore uh, include, for instance, if we're outsourcing processing, how do we make sure that the organization to whom we've outsourced the activity will be aware of the need to delete the data? How will we ensure it is genuinely deleted? It's worthwhile noting that uh, the case which was brought against the safe harbor framework was driven by the gentleman I mentioned earlier discovering when he asked for some data from Google, what they gave him was data going back a long way, including data which he was absolutely certain that he had already deleted. So full lifestyle, life cycle protection would make sure the data was genuinely deleted at the point when it was no longer required for the original purposes. The sixth principle says what you're doing should be visible and transparent. And transparency is written into the first principle, the first data processing principle under Article 5 of GDPR. So it's not surprising to find it here as one of the foundational principles of data protection by design. It should be very clear to data subjects what you're doing and why you're doing it. Anything that is written to describe it should be made as clear as possible. You should do nothing that's going to obfuscate the activities for data subjects. They should be really, really clear on what you're doing. They should be able to access and understand it. Uh, and of course, uh, that doesn't mean they should be able to access other people's data. They need to be able to access what you're doing with their data. And the final principle is that you should respect user privacy. So you should be looking at the processing of data and thinking about how do we make it easy for the data subjects themselves to know what's going on and to be able to access it. And the um, concept of making it user-centric turns up very strongly in the requirements in GDPR that controllers facilitate the exercise by data subjects of their rights. And facilitate really does mean make it easy. It goes beyond transparency to say, uh, for instance, if you're going to run a user preference center, it should be very easy for data subjects to determine by uh, looking at the uh, preference center, what you're doing with their data to uh, determine at a granular level that they want you to stop doing a certain thing, they object to another, or whatever the actual uh, activity is. And then you should be able to respond to it. So the way you approach data protection should really be user-centric. The International Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners have been encouraging ever since uh, 2010 the adoption of the principles of that privacy by design uh, framework. They've been fostering the adoption into legislation. The uh, US Federal Trade Commission recognized privacy by design as a concept back in 2012. And as we've seen, it's been incorporated by the European Commission into the uh, GDPR. So it's an internationally recognized framework work sponsored by the Canadian uh, Privacy Commissioner, uh, incorporated in effect by, uh, determined, incorporated into the, into the regulation and so now has the force of law. And as I said, there is a specific um, fine under the 2% uh, tariff for failing to comply with the requirements to incorporate data protection by design and default. So when you're thinking about how do we apply those principles, you need to be thinking about the uh, information technology itself. You need to be thinking about the hardware. The hardware or the systems that you're running, those should be driven by the business practices and the applications that you are going to need to operate them. So it's a very well-established principle of IT governance that the business requirements for information should determine the business applications. It's the business applications that should determine the operating system and infrastructure, and it's the infrastructure requirements that should determine the total IT hardware environment. Sadly, in many organizations, it tends to be the other way around. It's the IT organization who finds some kit that's really interesting um, or some systems that are really interesting, and they deploy that in a way that disrupts what the organization is trying to do. So the 
data protection by design and by default really does flow down the route of saying, let's determine what our business practices are, what's the information we need to run the business to meet our obligations to our customers. Um, how do we uh, design our physical and network infrastructure? How do we build our overall inf information technology environment in such a way that we can reflect those data protection by design principles in what we're doing? So a number of areas where you might, for instance, think about data protection by design and by default, often the areas in where it hasn't been thought about. So CCTV, surveillance cameras and mass transit systems. A CCTV uh, camera system is going to be collecting images of people all the time. A CCTV image is personal data. It identifies you very clearly. It identifies where you were, what you were doing. Um, and uh, Data protection by design wonders what the lawful basis of collecting that data is, wonders how it's made transparent to the data subject what's going to happen with their data. How, as a data subject, do you interact with that level of surveillance? How do you make sure the data isn't made available to people who shouldn't have it? Biometrics used in casinos and gaming facilities, which uh, they might uh, argue are being put there for your protection, but are they really? Are they being put there in case uh, it might turn out that a person with a particular biometric identifier has been a successful gambler in a number of other um, casinos? To what extent is the organization in those circumstances being transparent with the data subjects as to why it's collecting that information? Do gamblers even know of the extent to which biometrics might be uh, uh, collected to, uh, to track them? Smart meters and the smart grid. To what extent does a smart meter identify uh, who owns and operates it, who's home at what time? What type of information does a hacked smart grid make available to an attacker? Uh, to what extent do mobile devices reveal uh, what's going on with people? There are countries in the world where uh, the fact that you have a mobile device doesn't make you at all secure because the uh, mobile device infrastructure itself has been uh, corrupted and is uh, therefore your messages are able to be listened into where you are can be tracked. It's now not uncommon that the uh, GPS positioning uh, software in most mobile phones would enable people to be placed at a position and a time of day within a couple of meters of where they actually were. That uh, locational data is also identified by GDPR as personal information. It identifies where you are. And so data protection by design and by default wonders about the extent to which you've been made aware of in your mobile phone, how GPS data can be used against you. Some of the more advanced um, uh, thrillers, detective-oriented thrillers, will see criminals deliberately leaving mobile phones behind when they go out to do whatever it is they shouldn't be doing. Uh, they put mobile phones into Faraday envelopes, which mean that they can't send signals. Those are things which hyper-aware people are already doing to protect themselves. But the data protection by design uh, uh, brief would be that mobile phones should make it very easy for you to switch off locational data to make it not possible for somebody to track where you are, to make it possible if they were being transparent and being user-centric for you to use GPS to work out where you want to go without being tracked by the authorities somewhere. Near field communications, uh, the ability of, for instance, advertisers to show you whatever it is they think that you want to be want to see as you walk past them, as you walk down the aisle in the supermarkets to have the particular dog food that um, the supermarket knows that you bought previously, uh, leaping off the shelf at you and saying, hello, buy some more of me. To what extent were you aware when you were buying the dog food that that type of data might be taken uh, together with the information the organization has around your mobile phone to uh, market and advertise to you. Uh, RFIDs, redesigning uh, geolocation data, remote home health care. They're all areas where the uh, current reasonably leading edge of technology is going uh, in ways that is not taking, in most cases, any notice at all of the rights of data subjects to uh, privacy. And these are all areas, big data, data analytics, uh, the automated profiling, all areas where organizations that are doing them are likely to find themselves at risk when GDPR comes into play because they're not 
going to be able to demonstrate that they've paid any real attention to the rights and freedoms of data subjects, but they are taking advantage of personal data to which they have no right uh, to pursue their own corporate objectives. So the requirements around data protection by design and by default are relevant to lots of organizations and of course not just to organizations that fall into those kind of areas I was briefly talking about into all types uh, of organizations and therefore uh, when thinking about GDPR, business executives as well as the data protection officer need to have a, an understanding of the logic of data protection by design. When you're saying, let's go do X, you need to have, be able to say, and when we do X, this is what we're going to do with personal data. It's become normal for an organization when thinking about a new business strategy, if there are health and safety implications to think about how you would deal with those. If there are um, uh, traditional criminal issues, uh, if you're thinking about opening a data center in an area where there's a high crime rate, those are the kind of questions executives are well used to asking. Data protection by design and by default, privacy by default, says that business executives should have those kinds of questions around data protection as well. Risk managers, the risk recognition and management of risk should not just deal with risk to the organization, but risk to the rights and freedoms of natural, per natural persons. Designers of processes, of products, uh, business analysts, uh, software engineers, most software engineers don't have much exposure to data protection. It's a key part of developing software, software that's processing personal information that might, for instance, even if it's only online identifiers or some other uh, mechanism which will identify a person, the placing of cookies, all of these need to be dealt with computer scientists, application developers. So the requirements around data protection by design and by default really do affect everybody. And the ICO, again, in that same uh, speech earlier on in January, went on to say that organizations have to take account of the uh, cost to the organization, can take account of the cost to the organization, but having done that, they still have to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to demonstrate they're doing what they should be doing. So the implication of that clearly is that what's appropriate for one organization might not be appropriate for another. One organization might have financial resources, which are significantly different from others. One organization's processing might expose data subjects to significantly greater risks than another organization. So there is no one size fits all approach. There's simply the requirement that taking into account the state of the art, not a defined phrase, the cost of implementation, uh, the organization implements controls which will ensure that the data protection principles are effectively implemented and that the safeguards necessary for processing become part of the standard requirements of how the organization operates. The starting point for doing that effectively is a data protection impact assessment. Now, if you're thinking about data protection impact assessments as things you only have to do if you have to do them, you could be missing a trick. It's certainly the case. Article 35 of GDPR says that a DPIA is necessary under certain circumstances. A DPIA is a, a process for assessing the likelihood and impact to the data of data subjects of a range of things that might happen. So a DPIA is to a very real extent a subset of the organization's approach to risk management. Where you already have expertise and understanding about how to do risk assessments, where you already have conclusions and views about exposures, all of that should be incorporated into how you do a data protection impact assessment, should feed into uh, the recognition of risks to the rights and freedoms of data subjects. The key shift though from a traditional approach to risk assessment is recognizing that a DPIA is looking at risks to the rights and freedoms of persons, whereas the corporate risk assessment is looking at risks to the organization itself. And the appetite for risk might be very different in each of those environments. An organization might be very open to risk in regard to its own processing because it recognizes the relationship between risk and reward, but it might not be able to be quite so open to risk in relation to data subjects because data subjects have a different view perhaps of their data than does the organization. 
So Article 35 says that uh, a DPIA is required under specific circumstances. And those circumstances are where a process is using new technologies and where taking into account the nature, scope, context, and purposes of the processing, there is a high risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects. So the obligation to do a DPIA kicks in where there is a high risk to rights and freedoms. And in particular, says GDPR, it applies where the organization is engaged in automated profiling or processing that uh, has uh, outcomes that have legal impacts on the people concerned. Uh, two, where the processing is on a large scale of special categories of data, remembering that special categories of data are uh, information about uh, politics, philosophy, um, uh, uh, sexual nature, uh, biometrics, health, genetics, all of that kind of information fall into the special categories of data, the processing of which is prohibited unless you can identify an exception, one of the exceptions listed in Article 9 of GDPR as being applicable to the processing you're doing. So that's the second area where a D PIA is mandatory. And the third is where you are systematically monitoring a publicly accessible area on a large scale. Typically, this will apply to organizations operating CCTV. And typically, if you're caught by the requirement to have a DPIA, you'll also be caught by the mandate to have a data protection officer. Now, if you have to have a DPIA, GDPR says you need to consult your DPO on what you're doing. It's uh, expected that supervisory authorities will publish lists of specific types of processing where uh, a DPIA is necessary, but you might not want to wait for that to happen because uh, you might be engaged in any one of those activities which are seen as high risk and therefore you need to get a DPIA moving. You need to have done one and determined what the requirements are as a result of that and put it into uh, place uh, long before May. So four areas where DPIA is mandatory, automated processing, large scale of special categories, systematic monitoring of a public area and the large-scale systematic monitoring and uh, the use of new technologies that is likely to create a high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. It's not a one-off exercise, a DPIA. There is a specified way that you should be uh, carrying out a, a DPIA. Uh, the way you're approaching it, you should think about applying it to new systems and processes. So if you have a new system under development right now, now's a good time to get a DPIA into place to build it in so that by the time it comes to be launched next year, it's already compliant. Remember, May next year is the to be compliant by date, not to be compliant after date. So look at legacy systems, look at systems where you are already within the scope of GDPR for DPIA, you're doing any of those things, you're operating CCTV on a large scale, you're uh, doing automated profiling. Update your risk register to demonstrate you've identified, remember the requirements to demonstrate compliance, update project plans. If there is a breach, and remember we work in a world where breaches are uh, not unlikely but highly likely, the fact that you've dealt with it, you've demonstrated accountability, it's on the board agenda, it's in the corporate risk register, all goes towards breach mitigation, towards the argument that you have not been negligent. Make risk assessment part of staff training um, and, uh, 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 and so on moving into thinking about a DPIA as more than something which you simply have to do on a mandatory basis. Begin thinking about a data, data protection impact assessment as how you tackle embedding data protection by design beyond simply in those core high-risk processes. Think about how a DPIA is a practical thing to be doing for any high-volume processing, even where there is simply risk, not high risk, but risk to rights and freedoms uh, as a way of making sure that the what you learn from the DPIA is built into your processes. And the privacy compliance framework, the combination of how you deal with governance, uh, the board's role in risk and compliance management across GDPR, the way that flows into the organization's policies, procedures, and controls, and how that all links up to the six data processing or six privacy principles, the privacy 
uh, the personal information management system, uh, that combination of uh, documents and activities, that privacy compliance framework emerges in its working form over a period of 12 to 18 months as a result of the drive to use DPIAs to embed data protection by design and by default. So I just want to talk finally a bit about the uh, requirements to demonstrate compliance that I referred to earlier on. Recycle 78 and Recycle 108. Recycles are not the law. They're ways of uh, understanding what was meant by the law. You can refer to them in trying to understand a clause or arguing what you've done makes sense, but they're not the law itself. So Recycle 78 says in order to be able to demonstrate compliance, you should have in place internal measures and policies which meet in particular the principles of data protection by design and by default. And in the absence of an adequacy decision, in other words, um, the European Commission determining that the foreign country to which you want to transfer data has an adequate data protection regime, then the uh, controller should take appropriate measures to ensure that the data is protected in its uh, movement beyond the borders and that that should take into account the principles of data protection by design and by default. So the recycles to GDPR give the uh, data protection by design principles uh, something very close to uh, legal status. They not necessarily because the recycles themselves are not uh, the law. Articles 25, 29, and 47, on the other hand, go a little bit further. These are part of the regulation. Article 25 says that the controller imp must implement appropriate technical and organizational measures that by default ensure that only personal data necessary for each specific purpose of the processing are processed. So by default, you minimize the amount of data that you collect. And that means that the user-centric data minimization approach that we looked at earlier on needs to be built into how you design and build processes. Article 29 says the task of the DPO to monitor compliance with the regulation uh, and to make sure that the policies of the controller or processor in relation to the protection of personal data meet the requirements of GDPR. Article 47 uh, deals with the way in which organizations that are looking to move data beyond their borders or beyond the European economic area uh, using, for instance, binding corporate rules to give themselves a legal, free legal framework for doing that, um, uh, are, are able to demonstrate the supervisory authority has to approve the binding corporate rules, um, have to make sure they apply, apply the principles and that they build in data protection by design and by default. So in all of those areas, the, the notion of not just complying with box ticking requirements, but actually embedding it in the processes and the culture of the organization are very clearly written into the requirements of the regulation. Two standards that you can help to demonstrate that what you've done are appropriate measures. BS 10,012 is currently only a British standard. It looks at the personal information management system that organizations can use. ISO 27001 deals with information security management. And the combination of those, uh, particularly if you have accredited certification by a third party auditor, enables you to demonstrate not that you're in compliance with the GDPR, because only a court will decide that, but enables you to demonstrate that you've taken appropriate measures, you've deployed internationally or nationally recognized standards as allowed for under GDPR to meet your obligations for compliance. So for data protection officers and those who are in charge of data protection organizations, the key lessons to take are first of all that while you can have the most GDPR compliant documentation, the best piece of work done by your lawyers that you possibly might want, without an effective information security management system, you can still have a massive breach and that can cause reputation damage, data subject actions, significant administrative penalties, and the fact that you can point to really good documentation will not get you off the hook for failing to protect the data itself. On the other hand, if you have data which is adequately protected, you never suffer a data breach. The fact that your documentation is poor might never be an issue. Accountability means genuine top management engagement is essential. You can't demonstrate accountability if it's simply a data protection officer trying to make it look as though the organization is doing what it's doing. Accountability, by definition of the word, starts at the top of the organization. 
It's already a legal requirement, or it will be a legal requirement. The DPOs have effective independent oversight of the organization's activity. They need to be able to engage with cybersecurity teams as well as with uh, the um, quality management, system management, and internal audit teams. They must be able to articulate what our privacy by design means. They must be able to explain it to delivery functions to help them get to grips with what they need to be doing. And it means that the development of a business risk-based information security management system is an essential component of that privacy compliance framework. For organizations, the uh, things to be paying attention to, the UK statistics for uh, data breaches, which uh, show data breaches by sector and by volume, substantially reflect data breaches in the public sector. At the moment, if you go onto the Information Commissioner's website, the data that you see, only reflects to a limited extent breaches in the private sector because, of course, there is no current obligation for the private sector to report. The public sector is under an edict to report. From May next year, we expect that to change very substantially. The mandatory breach reporting is likely to mean a very significant increase in the number of data breaches actually being reported. You see a pattern in the US as the law shifted the obligation to breached entities to report data breaches, suddenly more and more data breaches got reported. It was the only way that you could comply the law, uh, admit to it and admit to it fully. So more breaches being reported means there's going to be more enforcement activity. It'll be driven, we believe, initially by, uh, by breaches rather than by uh, information commissioners or supervisory authorities having time to go and investigate uh, specifically organizations about which they're con concerned. Where enforcement activity takes place and you have and you can point at data protection by design and by default, we would expect that you would be able to uh, argue any fines for negligence down very substantially. Being able to demonstrate accountability should count very substantially in your favor, even if you have a breach, because breaches do happen. Uh, the fact that you've done everything you can to prevent it, you would be able to use to minimize fines. It takes time for the benefits of a data protection by design and by default strategy to show through. But if you think about the idea of it being positive sum, not zero sum, over time, it should begin to be a key uh, driver of profitability or a driver of profitability. And if you use it right, also potentially a method to gain market share, a competitive edge. Big risk that organizations will fail the uh, data protection by design and by default requirement if you don't today start looking at current processes and new processes and projects that you have underway. Part of uh, boards being able to demonstrate their accountability, being able to point at the fact that data protection is kind of what the organization does, is the idea that uh, organizations can manage and demonstrate they're managing data protection. That means having a policy around data protection. It means uh, security and um, personal information management system certifications, it means internal audits, it means uh, external penetration testing, it means regular reports to the board on the status of data protection activity with clear uh, um, direction given by the board so that the organization continues to drive improvements to the way it's dealing with uh, personal data. As an organization, uh, we're able to help uh, clients in a number of different ways, uh, a range of books, uh, toolkits, and compliance gap assessment tools, which can help organizations address uh, under their own steam the requirements of GDPR, a set of uh, training courses, foundation, practitioner, and DPIA workshops, which again can help organizations gain a practical understanding of the requirements of uh, GDPR, and of course, a very substantial GDPR compliance uh, consultancy program, starting with uh, gap analysis, uh, data flow audits, uh, helping organization implement uh, PIMS and information security management system, cyber health checks, uh, ongoing uh, internal audits, or whatever is necessary and appropriate to help the organization get itself into a place where data protection by design and by default does become part of the normal way that the organization operates. Which brings me to the uh, opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, for you to ask uh, questions. So uh, if you haven't, if you've got a question, you haven't already um, fired it, please 
do use the question function in uh, GoToWebinar. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the questions that have been uh, asked, type a question into the thing. Um, I'll read the question out. I'll tell you what the answer is, um, and I'll get through as many as we can. Do controllers and processes under GDPR include nonprofit organizations and private groups such as parent teachers associations? Uh, technically, yes. There's nothing in GDPR that says that a, a lawful or natural person who's small or might not have much money is outside the scope of GDPR. The only uh, area that GDPR lets off the hook is processing done in a purely personal capacity. So that looks as though it means that if you employ a window cleaner um, or you have lists of friends and, and acquaintances, that's purely personal. It's out the side side the scope of GDPR. But it's likely to be that a parent teachers association um, or a non certainly a nonprofit organization are going to be within scope of GDPR. It's likely that the data you're collecting will be minimal. It's likely that certainly for parent teacher association, the uh, risks will be small. But if the PTA is collecting information about children, uh, then possibly you have a different level of exposure. So yes is the answer. Everybody's within scope. So on data breaches, am I correct in thinking even a small breach would need to be reported to the ICO, such as emailing the wrong payslip to an employee? No, not necessarily. If a processor has a breach, irrespective of the size or significance, it's required to report to the controller. A controller is required to report breaches where it determines there is a risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects. And you're left to determine risk for yourself. And I would say that it's quite possible that emailing the wrong paste to an employee might be described as a low risk. Yes, it's a risk. It, it has an impact on both of the data subjects, but it's possible that you might determine it's a low risk. Emailing 500 or 5,000 payslips to the wrong people, on the other hand, that's likely to be a high risk. And determining the level of risk is likely to take into account the number of data subjects affected, as well as the categories of data that are exposed. If a business has a small share of its target market and securing a new clients is essential for the future health and competitiveness of that business, can you use the legitimate interest clause to guess email addresses and contact the subject, i.e. can this activity be classed as the legitimate interest of the business? It's one of the limited number of marketing mechanisms it uses. Um, not to guess, no, uh, direct marketing is a legitimate interest. So you're perfectly, uh, entitled to buy email lists. You're perfectly entitled to collect information from social media. You're perfectly entitled to collect information from anywhere that it's publicly available. What GDPR says is that before you start using it, you have to tell the data subject a lot of stuff. It's what you have to tell them is set out in Article 14. It's an article, what we call an Article 14 privacy notice. It basically says you have to tell the data subject where you got the data from, what you intend to use it for, um, uh, how long you intend to keep it, uh, what you're going to do with it, where you're going to store it. You have to give them the right to object and to exercise all of their other uh, rights, and you have to uh, do that pretty well as soon as you get the data before you start using it, and preferably at least 30 days before you do anything with the data. So um, you can you can use data. Uh, I'm not sure that there is a way in which you can guess an email address. You're perfectly entitled to try, but I think you still got to go through. If you guess an email address, you're guessing what might identify somebody. I think you still have to go through the Article 14 privacy notice process. Uh, yes, GDPR applies to B2C and B2B marketing in the same way. Uh, those marketing blogs that suggest B2B marketing is out of scope are being written by people who live in hope. Uh, it's not out of scope. Uh, I challenge anybody in any of those marketing blogs to identify an article in GDPR which says that business-to-business uh, -business email addresses don't identify uh, natural persons. Of course, info at IT governance doesn't. So info at IT governance you can market to until the cows come home. But Alan called it IT governance identifies me, so you can't. There has been much discussion around B2B details and data. We've included that business data does not require consent. However, the right to erasure applies in the same way. Um, 
you are required to have a lawful basis. So your question goes on to say, are you saying that we are required to obtain consent to hold client contact details on our database? We're a recruitment organization. If so, how do we go about growing our business, contacting new businesses and so on? And the, the answer is, uh, B2B data, you have to have a lawful basis for processing the data. The lawful basis does not have to be consent. The drawback to using consent, frankly, is that it triggers the right to withdraw consent, which you have to action. It triggers the right to erasure. It triggers the right to data portability. And most sensible organizations will look at alternatives to the right, alternatives to consent. Legitimate interest is one. Um, uh, processing the data in order to fulfill a contract is another. So you might have a, um, a non-paying contract with a data subject to market their details to prospective employers. And you might enter into that contract and as part of that contract, you might say, and we will process your personal data in order to fulfill our part of the contract. You don't need to ask for consent to do that. And you might say, and we'll keep processing that data. Uh, we'll keep on marketing it until you tell us to stop. And this is how you tell us to stop. That would be perfectly legitimate under uh, under GDPR. So I don't think that you need to be concerned about uh, being able to grow your business. You just need to recognize that the acquisition of data and the use of data is meant to be transparent and is meant to put data subjects into a position where they know what's going on and can say, no, thank you. Uh, I don't have Peter recital 14 here. Uh, if you want to stick it in somewhere, I'll try and come back to it. Our anonymized cookie ID is GDPR relevant, where we have a technical cookie for recognized recognition of a person by a recurring website uh, visit. Um, to the extent that a cookie identifies somebody, it is going to be uh, personal data. If the uh, cookie, it's like a tag goes into a browser, as a result of which you know that the browser is operated by somebody called Alan. When they turn up again, yes, that's going to be personal data. Um, people can consent to that. Uh, they can consent to it by accepting cookies or by changing browser settings. There's a whole bunch of ways that you could uh, deal with that. The e-privacy regulation will bring greater clarity uh, around those specific technical issues, but it won't be here for uh, probably another nine to 18 months. Accountable business practices, do you need to audit who within an organization has access data and at what time, or do you just need evidence that people in a job role know their obligations of personal data? Well, it's really driven by risk, I think, is the answer uh, to this. It depends on what data. Um, it depends on what level of exposure. There are people who need to have access to data on a working day-to-day -day basis and whose training is such that they know what to do. Um, there are other types of data where you might consider that the risk of exposure is high and you might want to have an audit uh, process or a additional level of security. But it's entirely driven by your own assessment of risk. GDPR itself doesn't say what you need to do. Um, the need to do a DPIA is uh, not risk-based insofar uh, as there are three circumstances under which you have to do a DPIA. Um, it's potentially risk-based in the sense that where deploying new technology brings high risk to the rights and freedoms, then you need to do a DPIA. Um, you would do a DPIA in pretty much the same way, even if you call it a DPIA light, if you're doing it not because there's a mandatory reason for doing it, but simply because you want to find ways of improving your uh, your business processes. We're a small company. I'm afraid we're running out of time, folks. So I'm just going to answer one, maybe two more questions. We're a small company with less than 50 employees and around 50,000 people in our B2B database. Do we need to have an appointed DPO? Uh, I don't think so. 50,000 people, um, if there's just personal data, there is no obligation on you to have a DPO. The obligation is that if you're processing, uh, if your core business involves processing large volumes of special categories of data, uh, um, or you're doing automated profiling, uh, and I don't know whether or not you're doing that. Simply having people uh, on your database doesn't mean you have to have a DPO. It's likely, given that number of people, to be a sensible thing to have somebody doing a DPO. And if you have somebody doing the job, but you don't call them a DPO, the law will still treat them as a DPO. You won't be able to sack them because you don't like their advice. <laughs>
I'll just do one more question. What happens to organizations that can't comply with GDPR by May the 25th? And the answer is, I have absolutely no idea. It depends entirely on whether or not uh, you find yourself the subject of an investigation by a supervisory authority. And therefore, you have to determine whether or not you're going to have a data breach or somebody's going to report you or bring a case against you, either of which will trigger an investigation. If you think you can't be GDPR compliant, but you can make substantial progress towards it, well, I'd get to work right now, knowing that uh, if there is an investigation, you're at least going to be able to say, this is what we have done. We didn't realize until uh, just before Christmas what we needed to do, but as soon as we realized, we put a plan together, we've got on with it, here's what we've been doing, this is what we're going to be doing. Uh, we know you're probably going to fine us, but really, we haven't been negligent, we just, uh, you know, we were so busy doing other things we weren't aware. And I would imagine, and I stress imagine, that that would be a reasonable argument for getting the fine reduced. The uh, supervised authorities are saying clearly they're not looking for opportunities to punish people. They um, are looking for ways in which they can deploy their powers appropriately to ensure that uh, organizations understand their obligations under the General Data Protection Regulation. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that brings us to the end of the time we have. Uh, the slides are going to be made available to those of you registered on the webinar together with as many of the questions we've been able to um, answer. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, there will be uh, an ongoing series of webinars uh, through uh, next year, both uh, introductory webinars for people looking at GDPR for the first time, of whom there are a very substantial number, and looking at special subjects in the same ways we've been touching on data protection by design and by default. They're all continue to be free. Do feel free to join us. If you think that we can help you on your GDPR journey, please come on to our uh, website and we'll do uh, whatever we can in any of the ways that might be appropriate. So thank you very much for being with us today, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you all a uh, good afternoon. Thank you.